All right. Today we're here with Anthony Adams, Anthony Spice Adams. Uh, if you haven't already seen him online or on Twitter or on Vine, I <laughs> I strongly encourage you to go see this man at work. Um, he just recently retired from the NFL. With that being said, I, speaking of these videos, my first question, I mean, how much, if any of these videos, did you script? Like, I'm just sitting, like, I just watched the retirement one again, and I was like, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is killing it. Did you practice that at all? I mean, let, let me know, because I've always felt the D-linemen, when I played, all the D-linemen were hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. They always say the O-linemen are smart. Well, D linemen are smart and they're humorous. So let me know. <laughs> let, let me know how much of this was w was scripted and all of that. Let me know because that it, it was nice. Well, it's uh, I basically just tell my wife to just start shooting, and then uh, she never really knows what I'm gonna do. So um, I just tell her to just you know just hit record, and uh, I'll tell her. You know, like, hey, we're gonna go on a White Castle or whatever, and you know, just just follow my lead. That's basically how it goes. Like, I don't I don't write anything down. Like, everything is just off the cuff, as they say. So, and that's like that's what all the videos. I think I got like twenty of them up now. I got vlogs and stuff now. So, uh, in the course of the vlogs, I scripted. I'm just just being me. Like, I just got back from China, just doing like a bunch of crazy stuff. So. It was cool. So, so could you take Wayne Brady and whose line is it anyways? Could you take him? Could I take him? Nah, I, I, probably not, man. <laughs> That's just like saying, can Wayne Brady take me, you know, if he play offensive line? Like, you know, that's that's yeah. his realm. And, you know, football is my realm. Like, I'm not going to disrespect that man and say, you know, I could kill Wayne Brady, you know what I'm saying? But you put on a show. That's what I'm getting at. It, it, would, be, it would be entertainment either way. I mean, I could hold my own. I mean, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, you know, I, I respect, you know, what those guys do. So, Okay. Okay, now let, let's talk about how we got to you even putting up a retirement video. Yeah. Um, so tell me what it was like growing up in Detroit, coming up through the ranks, playing ball. What, what was that like? What was, what was your childhood like? My childhood was was good. Uh, I was I never really played football. Uh, my mom made me play. It's, it's usually the opposite where moms steer kids away from football. But I was always you know big growing up, and you know I always had like a little bit of a temper tantrum. And she would be like, you know, you need to put all that energy in, into football or something like that. And I, I never really wanted to play. Uh, I always played basketball in my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we played just a little bit of baseball, but it was it was mainly always basketball. So uh, when it came time for me to, to play, because I was always too big for Little League, uh, once it came time for me to play in high school, she just, she just dropped me off. Uh, at my high school, and then she just kept going. And so I went up to the coach, and he told me to jog some laps or whatever, and, you know, the rest is history. But uh, I, had a, I had a good childhood. I was the only child, uh, but I had a lot of cousins, a lot of family, whatever. So it never really seemed like that, uh, that I was the only child. So I, I had a, it, it was fun. It was fun. We were playing tag and high go seek and all that good stuff. Red light, green light. All that good stuff, man. My my neighborhood was we we were live, man. We had we had a we had a good good block. Good block in Detroit, man. So Okay. Now when when did you start to realize that hey, you know what? Uh this is fun, I'm killing it. What what could happen if I kept killing it? Kept kept playing, kept getting recognition, mm -hmm. getting my name out. When when did that start, if that ever started happening for you? Well, uh, once I once I went to Penn State camp because I really didn't know anything about football. Um, and when I started, I was on junior varsity, and they told me to line up at guard, and I was confused because I didn't know if it was shooting guard, if it was point guard. <laughs> but like, I didn't I didn't know I didn't know any any of that. But all I knew was that I was real coachable. So if somebody told me to 
you know, drive a guy for 10 yards or whatever, then that's exactly what I was going to do. If he told me to keep my hands inside or use my hands, then that's what I was going to do. So I was, I was real coachable, and uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Penn State camp um, because uh, one of the older guys on the team at the time was getting recruited by Penn State, and he was like, why don't you go up there with me? And I was like, okay. And I went up there, and, you know, my coach told me before I left, he was like, you know, when you go through all the drills, just do everything 100%, do everything full speed. So I did it, and I guess people started noticing, and they offered me a scholarship. So, uh, you know, me being from Detroit, not knowing anything about football or anything like that, they asked me if I wanted to come up there, and, you know, I was like, yeah, why not, or whatever. So I accepted a scholarship there. So, uh, but make a long story short, um, I was doing good in high school, and my cousin, who went to Grambling at the time in Louisiana, he was hearing about me, like, way out in Louisiana. So I was like, dang, I must I must really be good if my cousin is hearing about me or whatever. So, um, you know, that's when I started getting the confidence of, you know, hey, I think I got a shot at, you know, going to Penn State or, you know, going to college and, um, you know, just to, you know, keep playing football at a high level. So you didn't really start playing football really till high school. Right. And you didn't even really start, it didn't really start clicking for you mentally and all that till junior, senior year, pretty much? Well, um, I was on junior varsity my freshman year, and then I got moved up. Like, maybe we were like three games remaining in uh, junior varsity. I got moved up to varsity. And then that next year, is, uh, I, I earned a starting spot. So around like my sophomore year, I was uh, I was pretty good. Okay. Now, what what was Penn State like? I mean, that's that's one of the meccas of college football. Uh, I mean, did you? It sounds like you didn't even know that going into it for the most no, part. No, I, I had no idea. I didn't. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. But um, I, I, I'm glad I did. It, it was different. You know, it was uh, so much discipline. Like you couldn't have chin hair. You had to be places on time. You couldn't sag your pants. You couldn't wear earrings in your ear. You couldn't have your hats on in the building. I was just like, man, are we going to learn anything about football? It's like everything we're doing right now is just like you had to wear suits on away games. So, I mean, it was just it, – it took a while to get used to, but, like, once you realize that you were part of something special and that – people care about you as a as a man and they're preparing you for the real world then you, you kind of like you start sitting back and realizing like man this is this this is what I need right here you know because nobody nobody else is really doing this and it was a uh, you know success with honor like it's one thing to have success but it's, it's another thing and doing it the right way and that's what they were all about doing it the right way now in that transition period, or throughout your whole time in uh, in college, did you have like whether it's upperclassmen or just maybe maybe it was an uncle or whoever back home who was like a role model role model for you? Excuse me. Yeah. Was there like a coach that was like, you know, took you under his wing and told you, hey, Anthony, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Don't yeah. go here if you want to. You know, if you want to study, you want to tutor, go here. Was there anybody like that, yeah. whether in high school or in college? Yeah, well, in high school, um, it, it was it was a couple of people who took me under their wing. Um, our head coach, uh, James Reynolds. Uh, we had a guy by the name of Tracy Thomas, who was actually my frat brother too. Uh, he was real instrumental, and in, um, you know, teaching me not only life but football, and you know, so it, that was cool. Um, in college, of course, Joe Paterno and. Uh, Coach Larry Johnson Sr., he was really the, the main person who, uh, you know, pulled me over to the side because um, I wasn't doing too hot in my grades around like my around like my junior year or whatever. And, you know, he was telling me that I had a chance to, to make it in the NFL and like because I, I didn't know that at the time. You know, I, I figured, you know, I was good and I love to compete, I love competition, stuff like that. But He's really the one who told me, like, you know, you got a chance to, to make it in the league. You know, don't don't mess this up. And, you know, he would give me Bible scriptures and have me over to his house. And they would, you know, cook and, you know, have, like, you know, parties for 4th of July and stuff like that. And, 
You know, he was real into into the word and was a family man and was somebody that I could look up to and that I still look up to today. And, uh, you know, still keep in contact with him, still go over his house. He, you know, sends gifts to my kids and stuff like that. So uh, he's just a, just a great man and just a great person to look up to. And, um, you know, that's that's what I really needed when I was up at Penn State. That's, that's good to hear. I mean, a lot yeah, of... Cause I'm, you know, I'm, I come from a single parent home. <laughs> You know, so I really didn't have like a father figure in my life. So, you know, I had a couple guys to fill that void. So it was cool. So before uh, Larry Johnson Sr. pulled, brought you under, uh, sorry, brought you under his wing, you, I mean, there's a lot that you didn't know about your potential, right? You just, yeah. you were just going to class, trying to get grades, trying to ball, trying to stay yeah. out of trouble. That's it. That's all I was doing, just trying to hold up my side of the bargain up. Uh, being a student athlete, um, but I was just, I was basically just going through the motions. Like, if I got a C, I was cool. You know, at least I passed. You know, but, um, you know, my freshman and, and sophomore years, you know, I was dean's list and, and all that, but, you know, you get caught up in being cool and, you know, I was a uh, part of fraternity at the time, so, you know, my image was, you know, the football player who was a, a and Omega Sci-Fi or whatever. So I was just, I was caught up into all of that. And uh, even some of my frat brothers, you know, pulled me aside like, man, what are you doing, man? Like, you know, you you messing up right now. So, you know, I appreciate, you know, everybody pulling me over to the side and getting me back on the right track. Okay. Now, do you have, do you have one memory, one, um, let's say one memory at Penn State where you're like, wow, I thank God I came here. No, not not just as far as confirmation, but just so magnificent. I, I remember I, I, we we'd get the uh, the uh, Big Ten games, whether it was Penn State versus Michigan, Penn State versus Ohio State, and you look at the you look at the stands, and it's a whiteout, and I'm just like, how are those dudes playing there right now, and their hearts aren't beating outside of their bodies? Yeah. Is there is there a moment like that that you can just say like, man? Uh, I mean, I'm at Penn State, you know, like I, I earned this. Well, um, I, I would basically say anytime you run out of the tunnel, I mean, uh, because you go through all this stuff, you know, two a days, uh, grass is like high where we were, uh, <laughs> where we had two a days at. So it's like your legs feel like you're running in quicksand. Uh, you you wake up five o'clock in the morning to do six o'clock runs. Uh, you got to lift. You got to make sure you're on time for your lift. Uh, if you lift at seven o'clock in the morning, you got to be there by six thirty. If you're there at six forty-five and not on the bike and you're late, so like you got to go through all of this stuff, and then finally, you see like all this hard work is paying off when you run out of the tunnel and it's 110,000 people out there. And if you make a play, it's 110,000 people just just jumping and rocking and hollering out your name. So I would have to say just being around that crowd and that 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 atmosphere is just it's crazy. And we always take the same bus ride to the uh, to the stadium. The same exact route, like every time we play, have a home game, hmm. and like you see everybody that's tailgating, you see everybody that's hitting the bus, and, and it's like people that are there the same time, like the same place every home game. You see those people, and you and you just like, man, you know, I can't let all these people down. And after the game, like you don't. You don't ride back home like you walk back to your dorm or to your apartment or whatever. That's how that's how Joe was. Like you know, you walk back home, so you got to walk through the crowd and stuff like that. And, you know, you always have people come up to you and saying how much they appreciate you and stuff like that. So you don't want to let all the people down. That's cool. That's cool. Okay, now transitioning to to the pros. Let's. Uh, I mean, how how was that like? Because I I mean, you 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 strike me as somebody who, for the most part, is really content with what they're doing, where they're at. You don't really look too far ahead unless somebody tells you. And when somebody tells you, you're like, oh wait a minute, let me start working on that. I can I can handle this. 
What was it like with the, you know, graduating, um, now transitioning to the combine and pro days and, and Mel Kuyper and Mike Mayock? All, like, what, I mean, what was that like? Take us back to those days, those training preparation days. Well, uh, I picked a great agent in Joe Siegel. Uh, and, you know, he was really, you know, instrumental in getting with the teams and working for me while I was doing the senior bowl like that week. So I think what was spearheaded everything. Um, I had a great, great week of practice. I had a great game. I had a sack, you know, pass breakup, a couple tackles and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I think I really helped myself in the draft. And then, you know, the draft came and like, it's, it's really not, it wasn't as big as it is now, like back in 2003 when I got mm-hmm. drafted. You know, now they got coverage over everything. You know, NFL Network is, you know, inside of the building and, you know, they, they film everything. Like, it wasn't like that in 2003. It wasn't as big. I don't even think NFL Network was out at the time. So, um, <laughs> like, Mel Kiper and Matt Mayock and all those guys, like, they were, you really only seen them on draft day. But now it's like, as soon as it get close to April, it's like everybody has their opinion on all these players. So, um, but that whole experience, it was good. Uh, my, uh, my agent hooked me up with a guy by the name of Tom Shaw and I went out to, uh, to Louisiana before Hurricane Katrina and all of that. And I was out there working out and, uh, you know, we got with a couple of guys to, uh, you know, simulate different type of interviews that I would do at the combine. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a great experience. It was, it was something that, um, you know, I could tell, uh, some younger guys, you know, what to look forward to. But, uh, overall it was a great experience for me. Now, were, were you ever, I don't know how to say this. Uh, I did something in a paper about it, too, here locally in uh, Red Eye. Yeah, Red yeah, Eye. I, I actually read that. I actually yeah. read that. It was now, like seven things to look out yeah. for or something like that. It was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, seven stages of a, a perspective a draft, a yeah. draftee. Um, now, I, I read how also you were at Larry Johnson Sr.'s house at the draft. And, right. you know, I, and you know, look, look at uh, looking back to two thousand four, two thousand five. I mean, you said it. The draft wasn't. I think the draft it's a it's a whole. It's like the NFL second or third season. If the playoffs are the second season, the draft for NFL fans is like the third season. I, I mean, everybody has mock drafts out. I mean, everybody has their own. You know, what <laughs> what is Tebow eating or you know? I, I mean, the, the coverage is, is crazy. Now. When you're at the draft party, any leading up to it, did you have any doubts or let me not say doubts because I don't think you go into a draft with doubts. But w- did you have any idea where where you thought that you would go? I know that you heard, you know, like first through fourth, but did yeah. you did you have a gut feeling about anything? No, not at all. Uh, because you hear all the time, and it's it's true. Uh, Maybe a hundred percent true. The teams that talk to you the most or tell you that they're going to draft you usually don't. Uh, so, and in my case, the Raiders told me this. They were like, yeah, we'll draft you in a heartbeat. I'm like, yeah, that's what I like to hear. So, uh, the, the Raiders, they had the last two picks of the, of the, of the first round. And I was like the next defensive tackle supposed to be taken, you know, as far as, you know, top defensive tackles. And, uh, but I mean, they, they still had two great picks. They drafted, uh, Tyler Braden out of, uh, Colorado and they drafted, uh, Nambi. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, dang, man, I thought that was it. Like my heart was racing and all that. I was thinking that, you know, I, I had a shot at going to the Raiders or whatever. But once that first round went out the way, um, then it was, you know, time for the second round or whatever. And I really didn't have any expectations after that. But, um, this was when I think the first through the third rounds were all in one day. But now I think it's like first round is one day, second round is another day. And, you know, all the other rounds after that. But so I didn't have to wait till the next day or whatever. So I was just 
waiting to hear my name to be called, but I didn't have any expectation. So after the, after the Niners took you, with, I think it was the fifty seventh pick. Yep. Um, I mean, obviously that's a relief off your shoulders, but also there's there's pressure now. I like <laughs> I like how you said now I need a suit. And I don't have a suit, but what I mean, what else? What else immediately sprung to your mind when you when you realized, man, okay, some the, the Niners got me. Now what? I was just like, you know, this is a long way from home, and like way out on the West Coast, like I. I've never even been to California, I don't think. So I was just like, well, you know, now, now, now work begins. You know, now I know what I'm working for and who I'm working for. And, you know, I just want to get a chance to meet some of the guys I'm playing with and playing against. So, and, uh, I was fortunate enough where, uh, they were like a, a older team. So a lot of the guys there, they were married, they had kids and stuff like that. So it wasn't into all that rookie hazing and stuff like that. So I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of got off pretty, pretty cool. Cause, uh, all, all I really had to do was get some Java juice in the morning. And, like I had to get it at like six o'clock in the morning or something like that. So, and everybody wanted their own, you know, special Java juice drink. I want a green tea. I don't want a green tea. I want one. I want one large. I want the strawberry <laughs> Kavana and all this. So I make sure I had to get the Jamba juice, you know, every other morning and stuff like that. And I had to make sure I go to Popeyes um, for the away games. Myself and uh, Andrew Williams, who got drafted in the third round out of uh, Miami. So yeah it was it, it was great man you know being a part of that organization man fans were cool and uh you know like we were just losing man yeah we had some terrible records yeah i mean that's that's part of it that's part of it uh you, you talked about the older guys that brought that were on the team when you got drafted by the niners who were some of the guys that you learned from to learn how to be a man, learn how to be a professional, you know, like who who were some of the guys that you that you gleaned that knowledge from? It was uh guys like Bryant Young, guys like uh Jim Flanagan, um uh Sean Moran, Andre Carter, uh believe it or not, T O T O was like, you know, he get out on the field, he's he's going a hundred miles per hour, man, and competing and all of that stuff, man. He was, he was just a phenomenal athlete. You know, I, I was out there with him for for one year, and then uh, it was Garrison Hurst, uh, Jeff Garcia. It was it was a lot of good guys out there. That the offensive line, Jeremy Newberry, Ron Stone, all those guys, man. They were Derek Deese. I can keep going on and on, man. But uh, they um, they took me in, man, and. You know, I, I felt a part of the uh, you know, 49ers tradition with, you know, Ro Ronnie Lott coming in and, you know, talking to us and stuff. Like, it was it was cool, man. I, I had a blast. The only thing was we were just losing. I ain't like that. Okay. So then now now you, or after that, I should say, you moved over to Chicago. Yeah. Closer, to, closer to Detroit, closer to what you're, let's just say, used to. What was it? I mean, you're going from one of the more recent dynasties in the Niners, as far as uh, fan bases, as far as tradition, to one of the, I would say, one of the pillars of the league, as far as icons and logos and the Bears. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, not only did you move when they had a, I mean, I think they've always had a good defense, but I mean, what what was that like, and what were your ex expectations for yourself? Well. Um... I, I knew coming in that, you know, I, I would get a chance to, to possibly start. Um, but I already knew that their defense was like already great. I mean, they had Tom Harris, uh, Tank was here, Erlacher, Briggs, Peanut, you know, some of everybody. And, uh, so I just wanted to contribute. I mean, whatever, whatever the case was. And, uh, I didn't get that shot right away. Um, but uh, once I did, I made the most out of it. And then that year, 2007, is when I uh, tore my tricep. And I was like, man, 
So I, I was out. This is my first time that I had like a major injury like that that required surgery. And so, um, you know, once that was, once I rehabbed and got back, you know, out on the field, then, um, <laughs> then I, I started maybe like my third or fourth game of, of, of that year after I came back from my tricep surgery. And, um, you know, the rest is history or whatever. But, you know, it was just a different vibe here. You know, it was me and Wes. And, uh, like you said, a lot of tradition, you know, eight, five bears. I just still big out here. And, um, you know, it, it was just a, a great thing to be a part of, man. It was a breath of fresh air. It's uh, what I needed at the time. And, um, you know, it was just, it was just a great experience, man. I had a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of people don't know, but the Bears are, like, we're just like a, a bunch of big kids, like, in a locker room. Like, everybody's playing jokes on everybody, so it's like, I fit right in. So I'm just like, you know, we were all, you know, kind of uptight, whatever, you know, being with the 49ers or whatever. Um, and then, like, going into the Bears locker room, I was just like, wow, dude, like, these dudes... They crack jokes and play around, you know, just like me. So I was feeling good. And then I got here the year after they went to the Super Bowl. So I'm like, man, you know, we got a chance to go back. And I think we were like 7 and 9 in 2007. I'm like, man, <laughs> here we go again. So I didn't get to the playoffs until my eighth year in the league. I was like, Man, I don't understand. Like, where, where am I going wrong? It's like not going to the playoffs just seems to follow me. But when we finally got there, we were one game out and we lost to Green Bay because we let them in. Like, we had the chance to beat them so they couldn't get into the playoffs. And then we lost and they got into the playoffs and then we lost them again. So that was just, that was heartbreaking, man. That's that's bitter. I could. <laughs> uh, so now you're you're not you're not a selfish guy. Tell us about tell us about giving back. Tell us about the uh, Ed Block Courage Award that you won. Yeah, that was cool. You um, your peers get a chance to vote who they want uh, to represent the team to um, for the Ed Block Courage Award, and um, my team voted me. I had just went through uh, through some deaths in my family. Uh, my aunt died. My mom's sister, she died. And uh, so I talked to Levy about, you know, going to the funeral and everything. And he told me to, you know, do whatever I need to do, whatever, and handle it, however I wanted to handle it. And the uh, funeral was uh, Friday, and I flew home, went to the funeral, and then I had to come back out. Uh, and then I, after that, I flew back here. No, I flew to San Diego because we had a game in San Diego Saturday because it was preseason. And so I had a game the next day. But um, when I went home to Detroit for my aunt's funeral, on the way to go pick up my granddad, my granddad died. So I had another funeral I had to go to the next week. So we had to bury my aunt, and then the next week I had to bury my granddad. So me dealing with all of that and, you know, still coming back to practice and play and stuff like that, the guys voted me for the uh, Air Block Courage Award for 2010. So it was um, something that was, you know, real uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, not only to have your teammates vote for you, but just everything that I had to go through. In 2010, so you know it was a it was a great thing to be a part of. Now, was 2010 the same year that you won the Brian Piccolo Award as well? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, the Piccolo, Brian Piccolo Award. Okay. Yeah, so I had I had a good year that year, and uh, but I had great coaches too. I mean, they, I think that was the year they brought in uh, Rod Marinelli, and he was uh, real instrumental in uh, you know teaching you all the techniques and everything. Um, in order for you to be successful on the football field. And, you know, a lot of people remember him from, you know, Tampa Bay, Warren Sapp, all those guys. And, um, you know, everything, everybody says true. I mean, he's a great coach, great teacher. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm glad I got a chance to be coached by him. 
Okay. Now, uh, also read about uh, Youthville. You give them back to Youthville. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? What is, what is Youthville, and what do you do for Youthville? Youthville is a is, is a place in Detroit where kids can go to after school. Uh, gives them a chance to get off the streets and do something um, that they may deem, you know, fun. You know, they had like a studio there. They got basketball courts there. They got, you know, you name it, anything you want. Like they had computer labs and printers and stuff like that. So if you want to do some extra homework or something like that, or if you got a paper or something you need to write, then you can go there and write it or whatever. You need to meet a tutor there. You can meet a tutor there or whatever. So it's like a one-stop shop for, uh, you know, kids and for, for them to do something after school as opposed to getting into some trouble or something like that. You know, so it's, uh, and I, and I teamed up with them, um, for, uh, I forget what year this was. And I gave out some Super Bowl tickets. Whatever year it was when the Super Bowl was in Detroit, I gave out two Super Bowl tickets. But I didn't just give it to the the person who had the highest GPA. I mean, because obviously that person gets it. I gave it to the most improved student. Like whoever took their GPA from a 1.3 to a 2.8 or whatever. And um, I still keep in contact uh, with him to this day. Uh, his name is uh, Daniel Billings. Uh, he goes to uh, Western Michigan. So, okay. yeah, it was a it was a cool uh, success story because uh, you know he was struggling at the time, and by him uh, improving on his GPA, he got rewarded for it. And uh, I think ever since that point, like he realized that you know if I keep improving my scores every year that good things are going to happen for me. And uh, hopefully I was that spark that, uh, um, you know, drove him to start, you know, getting better grades and stuff like that. So that was a cool story. Yeah, it's always, and I, I hope that more guys start to do it when they have the uh, they have the means to, but it's always good to see players, guys, give back and actually have contact with kids um, that don't get it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. I mean, kids are kids, but you were saying at the beginning of this interview how Larry Johnson Sr. pulled you aside, you know, and, and sometimes all it takes is that one voice, that one person to, to feel that it's necessary to invest a good word in you. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes, you know. So that, that to me, I mean, that, that inspires me to not be, not be selfish, you know, to reach out, go to the Boys and Girls Club talk to the kids, you know, give them a high five, let them beat you in, you know, horse or whatever when you're playing basketball, because that's now, what they remember. <laughs> I disagree with you on that. Well, okay. You no know, horse. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> But yeah, may, maybe smash them in horse. You never know. What I mean, <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever sinks in their mind that like, hey, you know, actually being on top of my life, my grades, my situation can can take me places. You know, it's not all, you're, you're not always gonna find that in a book. You know, yeah. and so that that's always good to hear. Oh wow! So obviously, obviously, we talked about it right off top. You you are a funny dude. You are a funny dude. I uh, I made the mistake of while I was at work earlier of clicking on your, I don't know what you call the dance that you did uh, in pregame, um, sort of like Drew oh. Brees pre. Do oh, you have a name? Dance. Say that again. The Fat Man Dance. The Fat Man Dance. Yeah. I, I mean, I I was at second ten and I was like, I can't watch this right now <laughs> because this. That would pump me up in such a way that it's hilarious. I mean, it was it was it was just kind of just just a last minute type deal, man. And, uh, so okay, every every game they always pick one person to to break the team down, and uh, so and you never really know what you're gonna get. You never know what this person gonna do. One one time we picked somebody, he did a 
a backwards flip, like a no hand backwards flip. Everybody, oh, that's pretty good. That's cool. Another guy just jumped straight in the air, you know, whatever. So, you know, this particular time, uh, the captains of the team, it's like, you know, pick, pick double A to do it. Let's, let's see what happens. And so I end up doing that and, uh, everybody liked it. So like the next week, they like, hey, you about to do this the rest of the season. Like they, they didn't pick anybody else after that. So, uh, it was one of those deals where I did it. And then they was like, man, you got to keep doing this, man, like the rest of the season. So that's what we did the rest of that season, man. I don't know how many games it was, but we started going on a little streak, started winning and stuff like that. So I guess it was due to the fat man then. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, so what now? What now? Obviously, obviously you're not working at White Castle. I mean, obviously. I got tired, man. There you go. <laughs> Two hours, man. Oh, uh, wow. Okay, now, now, uh, what, what now? Obviously, uh, NFL is. I mean, you tell me. Do you feel like you feel like you did your you did your deed. You did your you did what you could do, and you're done, right? Now, now it's time to start pursuing other angles. What what's on, what what's on the what's on the back burner that's now on the front burner? What are you thinking about going forward? What are your projects that you're thinking about? Yeah. Well, I'm done, done with football. And, uh, right now I'm in, uh, business school at George Washington University. Um, uh, get my executive MBA. So I'll have that, um, beginning of July. And, uh, so I don't know. Maybe I'll look into, uh, doing some type of franchising or something like that. Um, talk with a couple of guys that, that own their own restaurants. And so I, I want to look into, uh, I don't know, some type of uh, quick serve restaurant. We'll see what happens. I don't know. I got to find out which one to be more feasible for me, and I'll start off small, and maybe I'll work my way into owning multiple franchises. I don't know yet. But um, in the meantime, in between time, I want to do, like, some TV and some radio and stuff like that. So I got a little opportunity with, you know, working with different local companies around the area Maybe I'll do some, some post game for Chicago Bears or something like that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. And I know most of my fan base is, is from football. So I want to stick around football as, as, as much as possible because I, I am a fan and, uh, I do have a different take and a different view on what goes on at the games. So, you know, I watch. I watch the big uglies go at it and, you know, I could, you know, find out, you know, what's going on inside on the, on the line, the different line plays and stuff like that. So I want to talk about that if at all possible. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So you're trying to be like, uh, Siragusa, you know, on the, on the sidelines or are you trying to be more like, you know, breaking <laughs> down from for it, you know, whatever, whatever opportunities present themselves to me, but. Um, it's, it's, it's always good to have a fat man on the sidelines. You know, they, they like the sergeant at arms. They keep everything, they keep everything, everything, keep everything peaceful. So, you know, if I, if I get a chance to do some sideline reporting with Sarah Goosa, I think that'll be best for everybody involved. We don't keep peace. <laughs> well, you heard it here first, okay? <laughs> you heard it here first. Wow. Uh, now what? Okay, let me let me make sure I went over everything. Um, let's talk about social media. I mean, this will be the last topic, and then we we can definitely uh, work our way to the end here. Let's talk about social media because I think that you Peace. you Peace. you are a you are a straight genius with this stuff. <laughs> tell me tell me about Vine because I heard about Vine from some. Uh, some some kids and I was like, what is what what? Yeah. And then you know I'm looking at all your videos and I'm following your Twitter feed and I'm just like, what is going on? So tell tell me your take on social media and like what you like about it and just what you do in general. What your dare I say your game plan philosophy is? Since you're in my opinion, you're one of the few athletes that I would follow because most athletes it's like what what is going on? Why what is going on? You that's entertainment right there. I didn't. I didn't hear about Vine until like 
uh, I think it was like, like February or something like that. And so one of my friends told me about it that I should, you know, look at it and get on. Uh, Billy Deck out here in Chicago. And uh, so I got on. I was like, I saw how easy it was to just create like a seven or six second video. And I was like, that looked pretty cool. Then I started making vines and stuff like that. Then I noticed a lot of people started following me. So, um, you know, that was cool. But Twitter and, and Facebook and all of that stuff, like I really didn't get too involved with it, especially Twitter. I was always on Facebook. I was a Facebook guy. But then um, um, one of my buddies was telling me, like, look, man, you really need to get your stuff out on Twitter, man. He was like, dude, you funny. And he was like, you should, you should, you know, hone in on this, man, and put some stuff out on Twitter. And I was like, all right, I'll do it and I'll see what happens. And he was like, I'm telling you, man, you'll thank me later. And I was like, okay. So uh, I think I had already had a Twitter account. I just created one just to be like, all right, look, I got a Twitter Ta da, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, but then I think like maybe 2009 or 2010, I think it was 2010 when I started, uh, I started tweeting little stuff out at, at training camp and stuff like that. And, uh, I, I started noticing that I started getting like a, a little bit of a following. And then, um, you know, people wanted me to do more stuff or tweet more stuff or whatever. So I started to do that. And, um, you know, then it came time for the videos, and I put videos out, and, then, you know, the rest is history. But it's it's a beast, man. Like, I got in contact with White Castle through that. We end up raising $25,000 for autism, you know, just off of me, you know, messing with White Castle. Like, hey, let me get some cheeseburgers or whatever I was saying. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was serious about me getting some cheeseburgers, but at the same time, like, they were like, you know, they started responding to the stuff I was tweeting out. So it, it was cool to, uh, you know, get in contact with those guys. All right. Well, Anthony, I just double A, Spice. What other nicknames you got going on oh, here? Oh, man. How much time we got? I mean, I, I, can, I want to hear at least three more. Three more legit nicknames that you have. The, the most unique nickname I have that a lot of people don't know about. And it's uh it's it's like a first and a last name with it. It's uh Fat Back Grease Me. That's uh that's one of those nicknames that where people call you it and then you don't you don't ever answer to it. So it gets to the point where people start they, they call you this all the time and then you get fed up and then you're like, What man? What? What? You know, it was one of those type of nicknames that I got. You know, from my okay. So Fat Back Grease Me was one. Um another one was probably the uh <laughs> my aunt called me this. She called me Booty because she would always like, you know, uh I was always telling her like, Look, my mom told me don't let anybody touch my private area. And then, like, I was always protective, like, hey, don't, don't touch my private area or whatever. So she started calling me booty or whatever. So, I don't know. That's another, like, crazy nickname I got. Uh, my grandma calls me Sug, for, you know, short for sugar. So, you know, I got, I got a lot of quirky nicknames, man. I, I think I wrote them down, and I probably got about, like, 20. Wow. That, that people called me. Like, Julian Peterson. When I used to play out in uh, San Fran, he used to call me Atomic Dog. So I had, I had a couple of them, you know. Okay. That was funny. Okay. People now, tweet me right now. <laughs> so let, let let the audience know where, where can they find Anthony Adams. Fill in whatever nickname you want after Anthony Adams. But where, where, where are the places where they can find you? I'm I'm on Twitter right now. He's on Twitter right now. I'm okay. at I'm at Spice Adams Everything. I got a website, spiceadams.com. People can email me, spice at spiceadams.com. People can I just put out a vine about me picking up some fan mail at my PO box. I got a PO box, PO box five five four in Wadsworth, Illinois, six zero zero eight three. So 
I'm not hard to find. You know, I'm not hiding anywhere. <laughs> I'm on Facebook, Anthony Adams fan page. I'm on Vine, Spice Adams. Everything else is at Spice Adams. Instagram, all of that. I'm on YouTube, and I check everything and respond. I try to respond to everybody. So I'm not I'm not hard to find at all. Nah, I'm not hiding. You see, you got to contact with me so easy. Yes. See? Yes. It's easy. Yes. I made myself available. I'm here for the people. <laughs> I will say in closing, the first picture I saw of you, I was like, what is he doing? And I was like, who does he look like? Okay. I think it was on Deadspin, okay? So I click on I'm the Sam link. Sammy Sosa there? Sammy Sosa click. <laughs> and I I almost choked on my own saliva because I was like, that is exactly what somebody needed to do to make Sammy Sosa understand how he looked. So He followed me on Twitter and uh, like Facebook and all that stuff too, man. So that was pretty cool, man. That was another one of those things where I was like, hey, I told my wife, hey, take these pictures. She was like, ah, oh. started snapping away or whatever. Then I put it out. Then Deadspin got a hold of it. Once Deadspin get a hold of it, or Yahoo, it's a wrap. It's, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. All right, Anthony, I appreciate your time. We'll definitely be talking in the future. And is there anything else you want to say before we, we log out here? Nah, man, I'm good, man. I appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, let's do it again. All right, definitely. All right, man, have a great, great rest of the day. Hey, you too. All right.